Hello and welcome to Counterpunch Radio. My name is Eric Dreitzer. I want to thank you so much for tuning in to uh, another special election episode. You know, I have a sequence of episodes here on the show, but um, man, we've had some pretty significant developments these last few days. So I've been trying to put out this, I guess we could call it a special series of shows now. I hope you had a chance to listen to my conversation with Paul Street about uh, the election, uh, President-elect Trump, and uh, all of the rest of that. It was a very interesting and entertaining conversation, and I'm very fortunate to be able to bring another very interesting guest onto the program to talk about a different aspect of this um what can we call it? This this macabre dance that is U.S. politics. Um, I'm very happy to welcome Bob Fetrakis onto the program. Bob is a licensed attorney. He is a political science professor, and he is the editor of the Columbus Free Press, a very important media outlet that you should be following on a regular basis. Do check out the content there at freepress.org. Um, Bob Fetrakis, welcome to Counterpunch Radio. Oh, glad to be on. So, wow, I was just saying before we started recording, my oh my, what strange days these are. Um, So there's a lot to discuss, of course, but I want to just begin with your uh, initial assessments of uh, of what happened on Tuesday on Election Day. Were you surprised? Were you shocked? Were you outraged? Maybe all three. Give us a sense of what you expected and how you felt as you were watching events unfold. Well, uh, I, I thought Hillary Clinton would win the popular vote, and I thought uh, she would win, although narrowly, the electoral college. Uh, when I'm watching, uh, you know, I'm looking for little things, and the exit polls are suggesting she's winning in Florida. I was watching uh, MSNBC and, uh, of course, uh, some PBS. So. Uh, At a certain point, you can see this sort of shock among uh, the analysts and commentators because it's it's obvious that the exit polls that are projecting a victory are not matching up with the official vote count, that they're significantly uh, off. Uh, So I was thinking, uh, I've seen this before, but uh, this was much more of a you know, a slow motion kind of, uh, it's close enough, it can't really be happening. And the the word that most people were throwing around and have been for days is surreal. It was a whole notion, this can't be in reality. This isn't what's happening. Uh, But I I picked up a sense that uh, there was almost a sense of bewilderment and panic because the exit polls were so far off, which is usually a sign of election tampering. Indeed. So let's dig into that a little bit, because this is something that is being, well, I mean, quite frankly, I think suppressed in the uh, in the corporate media. Nobody wants to talk about it, maybe because the, 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 the Trump story is so big, maybe because there's so much ambiguity over this issue, maybe because it is perhaps the single most important issue that in many ways calls into question the entire so-called democracy in the United States. For a variety of reasons, though, the, the question of a discrepancy between exit polls and final tallies, I think uh, that is key and nobody wants to discuss it. So tell me what you've noticed in your in your research. Uh, what have you looked at since Tuesday night? Uh, and uh, what are your initial impressions? Well, uh, uh, Jonathan Simon uh, managed, as he's had in the past, uh, to get a hold of exit polls in the in 28 states. And the first thing that that strikes me is that there's a significant shift uh, outside the predicted margin of error, uh, which should immediately be a red flag and cause concern. But the even odder thing about it is uh, it's in 25 of 28 states. And in all 25, uh, it's an unexpected shift to Donald Trump. 
Uh, and there's very few explanations uh, for this. We can we can go through them. But uh, assuming that Edison Research Group, uh, the pollsters, uh, didn't suddenly become the most incompetent people on earth. Remember, they're the same people that in the uh, Republican primaries uh, got every primary right within the margin of error that Donald Trump uh, was running in. So the, there's nothing to, to say that they don't understand the Trump phenomena. Plus, these are exit polls, and these tend to be the most accurate of all polls because you're not projecting who will vote and how they'll vote. Uh, they're telling you as they come out. They just cast their vote two minutes ago. They're telling you uh, in a random manner. You're making sure it's random and representative. Uh, they're telling you how they voted. So in this case, if you had, uh, you would expect if you had 25 errors, shifts, that they would break down in a relatively even way. You know, 13 for Trump, 12 for Clinton, 14 for Trump, 11 for, for Clinton, even 10 uh, for Clinton, 15 for Trump. And you'd say, well, that seems a, a little odd. It wouldn't cause suspicion. The odd part is that all 25 uh, of these positive shifts uh, were for Trump. And again, that's the equivalent of taking a fair coin and flipping it 25 times. And 25 times in a row, it comes up heads and never comes up tails. It's just that the odds are extremely unlikely that that would occur naturally. Yeah, and this is really something that I think is an inconvenient topic for a lot of people because, as I said, it really does call into question every assumption we make about the validity of the elections, the legitimacy of the incoming administration, the legitimacy of the U.S. government. And so in, 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 in I think, a very real sense, both sides, Democrats, Republicans, the entire establishment, the entire political class has a vested interest in suppressing this information, keeping it, you know, obscured and, and trying to relegate it to the realm of conspiracy theory when in fact what we're looking at is empirical data. Right, now I'm, I'm, I have a PhD in political science. Uh, I've done polling, uh, albeit uh, not exit polling, but I've done uh, you know, uh, poll tracking, uh, pre-election, uh, various types of polling. I've done survey research and designed it. So, uh, you know, the, uh, there's universal laws of statistics. Now, uh, there's always, again, some other explanation. You know, uh, Edison Research Group suddenly decided to defraud uh, the election uh, uh, consortium there, you know, and, uh, NBC, ABC, CBS, Fox, AP, and CNN, and decided to give them absolutely nothing but garbage. Uh, I don't think that's a valid explanation. Uh, and also the other part of the suppressed story is that in 12 of 26 uh, primary elections, there was a unexpected shift towards Hillary Clinton away from Bernie Sanders. Well, and that I was going to get to in a second, because really this question about um, the discrepancies between the exit polls and the, and the actual data in the general election uh, certainly is worth discussing. But in fact, the primary election, we saw rampant vote fraud in a number of states key states, which uh, had things gone differently, we might have seen Bernie Sanders as the nominee of the Democratic Party. And um, although, you know, it's sort of playing out theoretically, according to the polls, Bernie Sanders would have dominated Donald Trump for a variety of reasons, including his appeal to the working class and especially the white working class. So it is interesting how everything has played out. Uh, and then when you look at the data, it does seem to be at least suggestive of some kind of a conspiracy to install a deeply reactionary right-wing government, just like in 2000. Yeah, I couldn't agree with you more. And uh, when we look at it, uh, 
the first thing you'll say, well, it, you know, it's impossible. So uh, when you're looking at numbers like this, there's uh, an old sort of acronym of, called his mister. Where you work through it, and the first thing you look at is history. Uh, and there's nothing that happened. Uh, and people are getting this absolutely wrong, wrong when they're saying, well, you know, it's the FBI director, uh, you know, at the last second. No. Uh, in this case, there's no historical intervention. It's an exit poll. You just voted. You're walking out. There's virtually nothing that happens in that minute or two between when you voted and when you talked to the exit pollster. So there's some deliberate misinformation out there uh, pretending like uh, there's a plausible explanation uh, when there's not. Uh, there's implementation problems, but uh, we would have been able to see that uh, as well. There, there was, should have been some breakdown in the exit polling, but uh, that didn't seem to be the case. Um, perhaps they sampled wrong. But if you look at the exit poll numbers, the famous N, right, the number of people uh, sampled is huge. So uh, after that, you know, you can say, you know, were they measuring wrong? But the measurement is who you voted for for president, right? Right. Yeah. In the state of Ohio, it was, there were four options. And uh, uh, it seems to be very difficult to get that measurement uh, wrong unless somebody's uh, intentionally uh, intervening. Now, there's other forms of random error, but you're not uh, seeing that uh, uh, in this election. I mean, when you look at to see if there was a problem with, say, representation, and you look in the New York Times, you can see that uh, the exit polls seem to be directly mirroring the nation as well as the states uh, that they were measuring. Uh, and I can't believe suddenly they don't know how to randomize. I mean, there's random number generators. Uh, there's formulas that are fairly standardized. Right. So none of that seems to make any explanation. So then you have to go to instrumentation, right? And this his mister, right? Once you get past H-I-S-M-I-S-T-E-R, there that second I uh, in the mister, uh, you wonder whether or not your instrumentation, that would be the voting machines, yep, exactly. uh, is measuring wrong. And that's where the most obvious problem would be. Since these machines are black boxes, they're absolutely non-transparent. Uh, and we allow partisan, for-profit corporations to secretly program the voting machines, uh, the the central calculator software, uh, as well as the voter databases uh, and the e-poll books, uh, and many we allowed to do election night reporting as well. Now, when you look at that, you're going, here's the obvious problem. There's no open source code. Uh, in Ohio, I sued, uh, asking them when I found out that they didn't turn on their safety features, their audit logs. I can easily recount in, in sequence every ballot cast and their uh, optical uh, image maker from the scan machine. So you can compare the electronic ballots cast with the actual ballots to make sure no one tampered with it. And the Secretary of State in Ohio fought me. So these uh, DS850s, uh, uh, which are used for the most part in 43 counties, uh, 14 counties uh, won the right, and thus really the rest of the state, not to turn on their security features. And this absolutely makes no sense. Well, it certainly makes sense if you if you're if you're uh, willing you to entertain right exactly if you're going to entertain the uh, the possibility that this was deliberate tampering. And you mentioned Ohio, okay? And you're in Ohio. Ohio is a perfect example. Of course, I think people listening to this program have at least some understanding of what happened in 2004. That uh, we have uh, major studies that have shown quite clearly that Ohio did not go to George Bush, but actually John Kerry, and that that really flipped the election. 
election in 2004. But in this election, in 2016, I'm looking at the data. If you look at the exit poll data for Ohio, it's essentially a dead heat. Uh, according to um, the CNN exit polls that Jonathan Simon was using, it was about uh, one-tenth of a percentage point towards Donald Trump. So essentially dead even. And then the final results show Trump winning by 8.6%, a shift of 8.5%. To me, that is, uh, is way beyond just a normal irregularity. I think it points to exactly what you're talking about, deliberate tampering in Ohio. And that's, of course, one of a number of states where we see this. Yeah, uh, although to be fair, uh, that's likely to occur once in every uh, 671,052 elections. So if we times that by four years, um, uh, it, it's a long shot at the least uh, that you would get that much of a shift. Uh, and then when, when you look at these voting machines, uh, the reality is uh, you got to think about uh, Trump goes to Vegas and you run through the list of the odds. He's hitting long shot after long shot. And even when they're only slightly off, uh, a lot of these are five to one. You know, there, there's four or five of the states that are five to one. Uh, so he has a 20% chance of hitting. Uh, but he's hitting all of them. Yeah. All of them have a red shift. He's hitting these, you know, the small kind of improbable, uh, you know, uh, ones, and then he's hitting these super lotto jackpots, not w just one, uh, but, you know, he, he's hitting like uh, 10 of them, 12 of them, uh, all improbable, stacked on top of each other, uh, which uh, comes to the point that if these results were outside the United States, uh, they wouldn't be considered valid by the U.S. State Department. Well, tell, us, tell us about that. Tell us about that, Bob. There's a two percent threshold that is commonly accepted for what uh, would be considered, I guess you could say, an acceptable discrepancy versus a red flag kind of discrepancy. So, tell us about that two percent threshold as a standard internationally, and why that's also not being mentioned in the conversation here. Well, because if you did, these would not be valid elections. They wouldn't be recognized by our own uh, government. Is that, you know, if you've got a 4.2% shift uh, twice, uh, which is uh, acceptable uh, with the margin of error, it's suggesting that somebody uh, has clearly tampered with the vote and you need to re vote. So, what they attempt to do. Uh, is to suggest that the universal laws of statistics apply everywhere on Earth but the United States. So they, uh, instead of looking at these exit polls and trying to figure out what went, what went wrong and going through the things I suggested to you, historical intervention, like somebody came in and uh, stole the uh, uh, flat drives or thumb drives or the personal electronic device with the votes on it. We know that didn't happen. Or looking at, uh, you know, the complete failure uh, of the system, some implementation problem or bad measurements or, you know, a, a bad technique uh, used by the exit pollsters uh, as you go. Or uh, once you get to the instrumentation, that's what's non-verifiable. We've got, uh, I don't know why courts would allow these companies uh, to use secret proprietary software. I mean, at, at what point don't you understand there's a uh, field, uh, an occupation called uh, computer programmer, and you can program these computers to get out whatever you want. And when you look at these companies, ES and S, and you look at their long provenance over time, ah, uh, you know, it's uh, Harvey and I have long written that a lot of this was being used in the third world uh, for so-called benign operations, uh, which were election rigging. Uh, during the church committee, uh, they admitted to over uh, 5,000 of these so-called benign operation, which means it wasn't a bloody coup. 
you know, all we did is stole the election. So a lot of this technology, and we trace it in our book, the strip and flip election of 2016, it's all in the public record. So, you know, we put in 100 pages of facts, you know, a bullet point from the public record, uh, and that's pretty much uh, been ignored uh, as well. Uh, and there's longstanding ties. For example, SOE, which comes out of Barcelona and counts the overseas vote and uh, the expatriate American abroad vote, uh, which hooked up with a company called SOE, they have interlocking boards. You know, when we investigated them uh, with Booz Allen Hamilton, uh, all sorts of connections and board relations with the Carlisle Group. Uh, so just, just, to, they, just, just to remind listeners, Booz Allen Hamilton, one of the major military industrial complex uh, contractors, of course, famously Snowden uh, had relations with them before he went into the NSA or as a contractor. Booz Allen Hamilton has deep ties, particularly to the neocon establishment, the Bush administration, but really all administrations. And similarly, of course, the Carlisle Group, George H.W. Bush, and many of the other nefarious characters of the last uh, generation or two. So we're talking the inner sanctum of the establishment of the reactionary right. Uh, absolutely. And why you would allow a company with those connections, uh, a company that has uh, you know, bought up the rights to carry your IQ, uh, the third-party spy software that can turn your phones on without you knowing it, why we would allow a company like that to secretly count our votes absolutely makes no sense in a democracy. Of course not. Um, we're about to go into break, but before we do, I just want to make one additional point here. So let's assume, just for the sake of for the sake of um, you know being conservative in this case, let's assume that Ohio uh, was going to go to Trump anyway, whether there was rigging or wasn't rigging. If we look at the numbers, the discrepancies between the exit polls and the final tallies that went in favor of Trump that actually changed the result, meaning had there been no discrepancy. Clinton would have won with the discrepancy Trump won. You have North Carolina by almost 6%. You have Pennsylvania by 5.6%. You have Wisconsin by 4.9%. And you have Florida by 2.6%. Without Florida, Wisconsin, Pennsylvania, and North Carolina, Trump isn't even close. That's how important this issue is. And that's why it's so important to point out that if we look at the numbers and we are reasonably, objectively minded people, you have to come to the conclusion that the president-elect and the future administration is illegitimate. Yeah, I, I don't know how you come to any other conclusions, and that, that would be the conclusion uh, of our U.S. State Department uh, and the standards set by the Agency on International Development. Uh, it's real clear that if this election occurred outside the United States, uh, our government would not recognize it as legitimate. Uh, it only would if the winner of that election was a U.S. puppet that they wanted to install. But if it was an actual democratic election, certainly the U.S. would reject it. Well, yeah, we would. Uh, if it was somebody we wanted to install, we would have sent the same people, Edison, <laughs> yeah. over there. Yeah. And a lot of the, I'm serious, a lot of these same companies would have been over there uh, uh, helping out with uh, electronic uh, voting. Right, out of, the, uh, out of the goodness of their hearts, I'm sure. Uh, and again, if, uh, there's, if you look even at the Clinton Foundation, some of these companies, it's no surprise she beat Sanders in the primary. Hig Capital that uh, you know, ended up buying hard inner civic, uh, former executives at Banco, uh, who worked with the Romney family to buy up the third largest uh, voting company in uh, before the 2012 election when he ran, is that uh, uh, they buy up these companies uh, and the company itself has 12, uh, uh, or the machine has 12, there's a vulnerability. Uh, they got a zero in all 12 areas. It was the worst machine company in the sense it violated all isolationist principles of security. That is, if you contaminated one machine in one precinct, you contaminated the whole county, and you could rewrite the audit logs to make it look 
like it was real. Absolutely right. Okay, let's take a quick break. On the other side of the break, we'll continue the conversation with Bob Fetrakis. Again, go to freepress.org, follow Bob's work. Uh, his, 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 his work is actually, I think, groundbreaking, and it's really, really important that we pay attention to this because we have a, a the, probably the most right-wing government maybe ever, certainly the most right-wing government since Ronald Reagan coming into power, and uh, this is one of the critical issues to highlight. So anyway, we'll be right back. Uh, stick with us here on Counterpunch Radio. Thank you so much. And we're back here on Counterpunch Radio. I'm chatting with Bob Fetrakis. Uh, so, Bob, we were talking about the discrepancy between the exit polls and the actual vote tallies and how significant this was. And again, North Carolina, Pennsylvania, Wisconsin, and Florida. I mean, these are really four of the states that gave the election to Trump. And in each of those states, we have significant discrepancies. But I want to play devil's advocate if I could. I would like to posit that somebody could come along and say, wait a second, why are you jumping to the conclusion that there was vote tampering when we know there is a major so-called underground vote for Donald Trump? That is to say, people who are, for various reasons, embarrassed or whatever, to publicly acknowledge that they voted for Trump, but behind the curtain, they pulled that lever or marked that bubble or pressed that button for Trump. So how do we know that the discrepancy can't simply be chalked up to that? Well, there, there's really uh, what you're talking about is, uh, you know, somebody who would be deliberately lying. Um, the vast literature on the reluctant responders, and it goes back, uh, you know, for many uh, decades, uh, indicates that people uh, don't tend to lie and these fall within the margin of error. That is, if you voted for Trump in your underground, you, you walk past the exit poller. And uh, and they count out the next randomized number and ask that person. It's just like uh, a survey research when you call a number and nobody's home. There is very little evidence that you're going to lie and say, I voted for Hillary Clinton when you voted for Donald Trump. I mean, the evidence suggests you simply don't respond. You walk past or ignore the exit pollster. Plus, there's, there's no real uh, evidence uh, that, uh, uh, that particularly in areas where uh, most of the Trump vote was, 
uh, those areas uh, were, were very rural and everyone was voting for Trump. Why would you hide or be embarrassed? You'd be embarrassed with your uh, uh, Clinton vote. So, uh, I mean, the, the last time I heard that was from Karl Rove uh, back in 2004 when there was an unexplained surge of vote uh, that wasn't reflected in actual people in polling places. Uh, he came up with a theory that uh, born-again right-wing women in southwestern counties in Ohio, Claremont and uh, Warren County, uh, were two of those uh, counties, and Butler County was the third, that they weren't shy in the um, morning, they weren't shy in the afternoon, but, uh, or the late afternoon, but right before the close of polls, uh, they began to hide and or lie to pollsters even though the demographics of the area remained overwhelmingly Republican. Now, people can say that, uh, but uh, the literature, the academic literature, doesn't really bear that out, that people are not deliberately lying the posters. Now, they're deliberately walking past them, ignoring them, uh, or swearing at them, but they're not really uh, lying to them. Yeah, and just uh, for in, in the interest of um, you know disclosures, I'm looking at these numbers. We do have to point out that there were some discrepancies that favored Clinton, but every one of those discrepancies was well within the margin of error, with the exception of New York, where there was nothing ever in dispute as to whether Hillary would carry New York. But I mean, if you look at Michigan, where it ended up uh, you know 0.3 percent swing again within the margin of error it's where it's where it's well beyond the margin of error that it seemingly and miraculously always went to trump uh absolutely i mean the, it was a similar pattern occurred in 2004 when 11 out of the 12 battleground states went to bush again it's a, it's the telltale sign that the the errors you know the results outside the margin of error the unacceptable or the ones that uh, you should investigate are all going in one direction. That's usually a sign that it's not a naturally occurring election, that uh, somebody is tampering with it. And uh, so I want to switch gears a little bit, if I could, and I want to ask you this question, because through your investigations, through the investigations of a few other people who have written about it, including Mark Crispin Miller, who's been on this show, who will be again very shortly talking about these issues, uh, these companies that manufacture and safeguard the voting machines, uh, their boards of directors, their leadership, you know, people in positions of leadership seemingly are of the most extreme right-wing ideological position to the point where you have to ask yourself, are they deliberately throwing these elections to Bush and to now now to Trump out of an ideological desire from various you know from their evangelical Christian perspective or whatever reactionary position it may be? Is that something that we need to examine more carefully? The ideological slant of the people running these companies. Well, obviously here in Ohio. I don't know how many times I've had to uh, say it, but I can't figure out why Democratic boards of election are allowing a company like Triad, you know, which uh, one of its subsidiaries created the butterfly ballot and sold tens of, stole tens of thousands of votes from Gore and delivered them uh, to Buchanan uh, in 2000, that they sold that uh, on their website of their company. Uh, as a commemorative item, you know, to be cherished. Uh, but Triad, owned by the Rapp family, the Rapp family, everyone in Ohio knows, uh, they're one of the most hardcore right-to-life uh, families. Their mission is to stop the unborn baby holocaust. Uh, and they're doing most of the maintenance uh, in the majority of Ohio counties. And uh, they're doing, in many places, they're responsible for the... Uh, uh, electronic poll books uh, and maintaining the voter database. Uh, also, if you go back to 2004, uh, Michael Connell with his uh, company, of course, uh, GovTech. Uh, I mean, 
Well, that was owned theoretically by his wife, who admitted she didn't really know she owned it or what her role was. But uh, he owned uh, New Media, right? That That's what did most of the PR and the IT work and set up the websites uh, for virtually every Republican candidate from the RNC to the White House where GW, uh, you know, uh, GWB43, uh, Rove's email, uh, was uh, coming uh, off of. So you've got that, and then you had smart tech, right? Uh, when the so-called supercomputers in Ohio unexplainably and unbelievably failed in 2004, uh, they outsourced the final vote count to Chattanooga, Tennessee, in the old Pioneer Bank building, where a former... Uh, Pentecostal evangelical minister who owned a uh, you know a wholesale you know book company and uh, and bookstore had gone into IT uh, and he got to count the votes. Uh, he owned a server farm and he was the backup that counted the votes and sent them back to Ohio and what absolutely looked like a man in the middle of attack. That's what uh, Stephen Spoonamore said. Uh, who had worked with these guys overseas. You know, Bruno Moore had said that he didn't really have a problem with us doing it overseas, but he thought American democracy uh, was sacred. But he worked with these guys in third world countries uh, when you could only describe that they were involved in election rigging, you know, in, in the name of U.S. foreign policy. Yes, indeed. You know, one of the other aspects of this story that I find particularly interesting, it has to do with this issue of voter suppression. And there's a couple of angles to this that I want to examine. I'm going to leave aside um, the media critique on that issue for uh, a few minutes from now. And I want to focus just right now on what information you have uh, as to voter suppression. And specifically, if we look at some of these major states where we had this huge shift in Donald Trump's favor, especially a state like North Carolina, which was clearly expected to go to uh, Hillary Clinton going by the exit poll data, um, North Carolina notoriously had a, a, a program of voter suppression. And if you look at the numbers, that certainly seems to bear it out. The anecdotal evidence uh, that we saw in the New York Times and various other media outlets, people talking about feeling intimidated as they went to the polls because of various uh, individuals, you know, dodgy individuals, uh, other irregularities, uh, deliberately created long lines so that uh, people in particularly in uh, black communities and minority communities might not have the time or the patience to get to the polls. So talk a little bit about what we know about the voter suppression that took place in this election and whether or not that is playing a key role in what we're seeing in these numbers. Well, if you look at the history of voter suppression, uh, Harvey Wasserman and I in 2004, uh, it came to our attention uh, in some of the local media in Ohio. Uh, for example, uh, in Toledo, Cleveland, and Cincinnati, they purged uh, in the run-up to the election uh, in an odd number year, uh, the year prior to the election, uh, and then in the presidential year, they began to continue to purge these inner city voters. And it's not custom in Ohio to purge in a presidential year, right? You purge in the odd number year. So all these purges we noted were coming from the inner cities. In fact, in 2004, uh, they purged 24.96% of every single voter in uh, Cleveland. And wow. we, uh, wow. we grafted out the chart. And the more the precinct was black, uh, the higher percentage of blacks in the precinct, the higher percentage of the deregistration and purging. Uh, in fact, in some predominantly black wards, 51% of all voters were purged uh, or deregistered. Uh, and then you had these uh, you know, and they were explained to me, but these voter numbers where uh, some of these areas had a 9% voter turnout of 12%, a 16%, and the mainstream corporate media will go, well, how can you explain that? 
And again, we're the free press said, what do you mean how you can explain it? If you've purged 51% of all the voters in that, uh, in that ward, of course they're going to have a low voter turnout. Yeah, unbelievable. unbelievable. And, uh, that, and, and then between 04 and 08, uh, they purged one, uh, 125 million voters. Uh, we at the Free Press anticipated this. Uh, we did a public records request under ORC 149.43, our open records law. So we were the only people that had the list of 1.25 purged voters, which as a nonprofit, we made it open to everyone. The only two, uh, two people that picked it up uh, were, of course, uh, the Obama campaign, uh, which, you know, would have acted too late. Uh, you know, they didn't know really to get it that early uh, because if you wait too long, uh, they're not going to give it to you. They're going to tell you they're too busy. And then uh, the other was Acorn, uh, which used the list to go into the inner cities and re-register people, then met a, uh, a fate I suspect was tied uh, to his very effective voter registration drive uh, soon after that. And then there was also a million people purged uh, between 08 and 2012. And they do this in a variety of ways, including uh, essentially uh, redefining what it means uh, to have an election cycle, purging people after four years instead of eight years. An election cycle used to mean a congressional and presidential election, and that was a four-year period, and then a second one, uh, presidential and congressional election, thus giving you eight years. Uh, but now you, you, we've seen purges uh, as soon as two years, and many of them in the urban areas uh, after uh, four years. Now, this election, uh, in the run-up to it, uh, John Houston uh, purged a million voters initially, but and overwhelmingly they're poor uh, and minority, blacks and uh, Latinos primarily. So what he also did and this is, this is in the local mainstream uh, daily newspapers. They just don't draw the same conclusions uh, that I do. He also failed to send out uh, a absentee ballot request form uh, to a million fifty uh, fifty thousand people. Now, these overwhelmingly, over 600,000 of them uh, were people that were eligible to vote, that they had moved uh, the vast majority all in the same county, some within the same neighborhood, in the same building. So they were absolutely still eligible uh, to vote. But by not sending them a ballot form and also by saying, uh, do not forward, return to sender, they could use that and one other return piece of mail to purge them. Uh, and Greg Palace has always already pointed out that uh, Houston had a secret list from the Secretary of State in Kansas, uh, Kobach, that 30 primarily Republican states were using uh, that was fraudulently claiming that minorities uh, were double voting throughout America by only a very loose match of the first and last name. So Paul Hernandez tens of thousands of them supposedly were the same person. For example, uh, uh, Mohammed Mohammed uh, here in Columbus. Uh, but I, as a professor, uh, I've had you know, at least three Mohammed uh, Mohammeds in my class. Uh, Mohammed Abdul Mohammed, Mohammed Ali uh, Mohammed, uh, and others as well. And uh, their names were spelled differently in, in many cases. So that uh, is what we don't know. How many of these supposed half a million people uh, were added to the million people purged? Uh, although the uh, Clinton administration, uh, uh, well, at least Barack Obama sent out letters and the Clinton campaign sent out some letters, some of those people were re-registered. But uh, also we had numerous reports on Election Day of people showing up to the polls uh, and uh, uh, having voted, but their names weren't there. It's almost a process by these electronic poll books uh, 
herds people based on some sort of formula, and they overwhelmingly only purge uh, black you know, minorities and poor people. I think the ideological question is important here because you mentioned Kobach from Kansas, and this is somebody whose name might not be so familiar to people, but uh, probably should be a household name on the left because this is uh, essentially the architect of that uh, of what amounts to probably the most racist law that the United States has had in the last couple of generations, that being uh, the law in Arizona regarding the stopping of people who quote-unquote look like they might be illegal immigrants. Uh, He was the architect of that. He has a history with white nationalist groups having given uh, lectures to various uh, white nationalist organizations, racist groups. I would would call him him a, uh, you know, a good old good old American Christian fascist. And this is the man who is uh, really kind of the architect of this myth about the double voting among minorities. And that was what Trump was parading around in the headlines regarding voter fraud. None of the legitimate issues that we're raising here, but the phony and completely manufactured problem of double, triple, quadruple voting among minorities. I think we can obviously see where this is going and what the purpose of that meme is. Oh, absolutely. And um, the reality is uh, the only place they really purge lists uh, is in uh, the urban uh, area. They they purge the urban uh, voters. Uh, we've got four counties, rural white counties in Ohio, that say they have a no purge policy. And even uh, more important, I think, is to ask the question that in a computer era, uh, in a state like Ohio that requires ID, why would you deregister anyone uh, and remove their name from the computer when in fact, uh, if they show up, you just leave their name on, perhaps star it, and they gotta show an ID anyway that they live there. Why in a computer era, in an ID state, are you deleting people's names from the computer uh, polling list? Well, the I think the answer is obvious. There, there is only one answer, and that is to deliberately manufacture the desired results for the right wing. And I, I just want to say, I, I waited pretty long into this conversation to make this point, but I, I just want to be clear. I am about as anti-Hillary Clinton as it gets. I in no way support Hillary Clinton. I have nothing but uh, uh, negative feelings and negative opinions about her, and I don't shed any tears for her. But we have to we have to examine objective material reality here, and the data is what the data is. And this election was stolen for Trump. I I couldn't agree with you uh, more, and. Uh... You know, I'm I'm actually a member of the Green Party, uh, which I helped to create in Ohio, uh, precisely after the attack on uh, on Iraq. Uh, and again, uh, I, I have a long history of. You know, I was uh, fought against the Clintons in '92. I was Governor Jerry Brown's platform spokesperson in the last battle, uh, you know, over NAFTA and the rise of neoliberalism. So, uh, you know, I have no sympathy there, uh, but I do believe, as you do, in election uh, integrity and uh, what appears to be the obvious tampering uh, with uh, the computer vote. Well, Bob, we're, we're, we're rapidly running out of time, although we could probably go on for hours. There's so many facets to this story. But uh, I think the critical question that I want to ask now is this. What are our next steps? I know that you had brought a lawsuit um, regarding the primary elections, which I think, just as this election was, if you look at the data on the primary election, I think it's clear, unmistakable, and uh, quite frankly, unequivocal that it was stolen from Bernie Sanders. I think that's obvious. Uh, So first question would be, uh, t- what's going on with that lawsuit? Is it still uh, pending? Uh, what is the status of that? And then the second question is, 
Are there any plans for legal challenges on the presidential election? And is there a way to use the legal challenge, a potential legal challenge, to you know, get discovery, to bring out more information, to make this public? Where do we stand and what are our next steps? Well, uh, the Edison lawsuit, uh, which I brought against Edison, uh, which was premised on a legal theory, that they're a state actor uh, and that they're colluding with the government uh, in almost an illegal cartel. Uh, I sued them to release their data uh, because they get special treatment from the uh, government and this assumption that uh, the exit polls should be adjusted to match wholly improbable uh, official results uh, I argued, uh, needed to be stopped. So that is pending. Uh, they're trying to get it uh, dismissed. We both briefed the case. Uh, again, we had the complaint. They replied. You know, we replied. Uh, they moved to have it thrown out, uh, claiming there's no collusion. Uh, our theory is uh, there's absolute collusion uh, when you adjust your numbers to the official tallies, when you know absolutely they're statistically impossible. So that's still pending. Uh, and we'll see uh, whether or not a federal judge is willing to go down that road. Uh, there's a couple other suits that we've moved forward with. Uh, I won't probably go forward uh, with the TRO, uh, that was trying to get them to turn on their safety measures. That'll probably be ruled uh, moot. And it also is really clear that the Republican judge uh, wanted, uh, you know, uh, to sanction me if he could get away with it, uh, but I really didn't seem to have enough guts, uh, but did indulge some of the most corrupt counties, including Mahoning County, where 31 uh, machines were flipping in 2004, and they admitted that their machines were flipping, and they left them in service. So it's a, it's a well-known county around uh, Youngstown, Ohio, uh, and a, a firm there, Waste Management, with a curious provenance uh, uh, in, in terms of where its money came from, uh, also illegally recycled all of the uh, ballots. So they were able to accuse me of impugning their integrity as well, I did point out with defamation and other such things, if you have no reputation other than being corrupt, it's hard to impugn one's integrity or defame. <laughs> so in that, and finally, we, we did file one with a state judge uh, who looks a little friendlier, which uh, against ES and S and uh, because of their secret patches, that they've continued to put on all over the state, which allows the Secretary of State, John Houston, to get the real numbers before anyone else. So uh, luckily that is before a, uh, a reasonable judge who's been friendly in the past, and we're hoping he'll let us amend that uh, to go into the presidential election. Uh, but we'll see. Uh, in these cases, there's such tremendous amounts of pressure for judges to attempt to sanction us or declare our suits frivolous and not to let us have any discovery. Because when we get discovery, as we did in the King Lincoln Brunsville case in 2006, that's when we found the architectural map uh, that showed how they sent the vote to be counted in Chattanooga, Tennessee, and how they had a contract to run the election uh, without the state IT people, but to run it with private contractors in the right to life movement. Unbelievable. Um, so, you know, the, the, the question I think uh, that really needs to be raised finally here is um, what do we need to do 
to undermine this administration. I mean, I think it's clear that it's illegitimate, as illegitimate, if not more illegitimate than uh, the criminal Bush regime was. Um, and is there anything we should be doing on the electoral fraud front in order to undermine this administration even before it gets into office, what would you recommend people do? People who are listening to this, who are outraged, who are outraged about how this has all gone down, what should they do? Well, uh, number one, they've got to begin to uh, begin to talk openly. As long as we don't talk about the obvious, right? Private, partisan, for-profit companies secretly programming uh, the software uh, and the computer hardware and the central tabulators uh, and the poll books uh, and the voter data list and doing the late right, night reporting. Uh, it's got to stop. Uh, and again, people are going to have to, uh, if necessary, occupy some of the boards of election. I personally would like to see, I mean, I like these marches against Trump. Uh, but in uh, a lot of these states, particularly Ohio and Pennsylvania and North Carolina and Wisconsin, uh, they should be going down to the Secretary of State's office uh, and or their key board of elections you know, in the Capitol uh, and occupying and bringing some yellow tape so uh, we break through this you know, wall of silence. So some some direct action. I think that's I think that's clear. And and I think that the other thing that needs to be mentioned here is that we need to be unafraid to talk about this issue. We should be unafraid of people trying to tar and feather us with the ridiculous moniker of quote unquote conspiracy theorists. Because quite frankly, the data is what the data is, and any objective, reasonable observer would look at it and say it's not conspiracy theory. It's conspiracy fact. Uh, ab absolutely, and uh, and on their side, you know, they're coincidence uh, theorists. They just think, uh, you know, Donald Trump hit the super lotto twenty five times in a row on one night. But it doesn't even go that deep, Bob. They don't even know that. They don't even know that that happened. All they think is, well, white people were pissed off uh, and Hillary was weak, so Trump won. And that's the extent of the analysis. But if you dig into the information, you dig into the data, it's plain as day. Uh, yeah, the, the stats are the stats. You don't suspend the universal law of statistics just because it's a U.S. election. Well, that's absolutely right. Well, we're going to have to leave it there. Bob Fetrakis, I want to thank you for coming on the program. Uh, again, Bob is a licensed attorney based in Ohio. He is a poli-sci uh, poli professor. Uh, he is also the editor of the Columbus Free Press. Go to freepress.org to uh, follow his work, of course, his uh, landmark work with Harvey Wasserman and uh, all of the work he's been doing on this issue. Bob, I want to thank you so much for working on this really critical issue and keeping us all informed and uh, you know, best of luck moving forward with the lawsuits, and hopefully we can have you back, uh, uh, you know, to check on the progress of that in the not too distant future. Yeah, enjoyed it, and would uh, love to come back. Thanks. Thanks. Thanks so much, listeners. Thank you as always. Speak to you again real soon. <laughs> <laughs>